After the war, the statesmen of the world, headed by President Wilson, sought to prevent its repetition by founding a League of Nations based on the following main principle. A general association of nations must be formed under specific covenants for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike. The covenant of the League was finally adopted on the 25th of May 1919 and all states were invited to subscribe to it. Before we take a look at the most useless body in the history of the world, the League of Nations, some sort of quasi-governmental egregore that formed just after World War I, I want to just talk first to the Googlebot quickly. Googlebot Please let this load. These are images in a movie from 1937. I'm not trying to upload Taylor Swift videos. It's from 1937. Nobody could possibly hold copyright on this. When I just, I made a free voice um, promo. It was one minute just saying go to free voice. And it said checks, it, ch it checked, the, just me talking for a minute in a sweatshirt. It checked it for 10 minutes for copyright issues. Every time I load, checks are taking longer than usual. I want to speak directly to the, to the Googlebot. This needs to stop. It's inappropriate, Googlebot. Let me load. Sorry. Okay, let's look at the most useless international body ever to be formed in the history of all mankind. The League of Nations came together after the Great War, World War I, after 1918 and said, this must never happen again, this death and slaughter. We must unite the world to avoid war. And saying that this is the most useless international body of all time, that's saying something, because think of how useless all the other ones are. Here is Geneva, the seat of the League in Switzerland. It is situated by a lake through which flows the river Rhone traversing the city on its way to the Mediterranean Sea. The old building of the League, from which it is to move at the end of this year into the new building before your eyes. Its first stone was laid on September the 7th, 1929, and it is composed of four parts. First, the Secretariat, which comprises the offices of the International Civil Service, responsible for preparing the work of the organizations of the League and carrying their decisions into effect. Then the Council Chamber. Then the Assembly Hall, flanked by the Committee Rooms. And lastly, the Library, which will be the biggest reference library in the world. The total length of the building is over 400 yards and its area is approximately 18,000 square yards. The assembly hall will accommodate about 550 delegates, experts and secretaries, about 500 journalists, and 800 spectators. Okay, guys, this obviously is not going to be a history lesson. I, I don't do that on this channel. We all could uh, Wikipedia the League of Nations. It is a reality discussion. It's, let's just start it here. I don't know where to start it, so let's just jump into it right here. If we could go back in time, we've evolved to a certain degree, the people listening to this, we know it would be doomed to fail. Now, if somebody's screaming out at me, it's so easy to look back, Matt, and say it was doomed to fail after it's failed as a Monday morning armchair quarterback. No. If we were there, all we've learned about the, the same mistakes that men and people talking make and humanity makes over and over, the repeating scripts and themes of this reality, I guarantee you, if we were there, go back in time, we don't know the history of the League of Nations, every one of us, or at least the old guard, would say this is absolutely doomed to fail. And that's where it gets into kind of a fascinating, we know it would fail. Okay, that's just a given. Let's move on. The, the fascinating topic of discussion is, you know, how... Did, how did how was it arranged to fail? How does re reality itself, the dark part of reality, of course, needs it to fail? Probably knows it will fail. So there's a variety of different 
um, ways to look at this. And it always seems like first grade truth that, uh, Matt, you know, the people that went, the delegates from the different countries, I'm sure they were trying to do their best. And, and I agree, you know, with what that person would tell me. I bet everybody that came in there from Denmark and from a, a representative from Cairo, Egypt, and they probably all thought, you know, we need to stop war. They're not like all in on it. They went there probably with the best of intentions. So how does reality get what it wants? It knows it's not taking a chance putting these people together. Re the dark part of reality needs war to continue. Uh, energy harvesting, louche, sacrifice of some kind. That's not the purpose of this video. We'll talk about all that, all the weird shit that dark reality does some other time. It knows it will fail. How? Is it, somebody might say, isn't it taking a risk bringing all these people together? Maybe there will be charismatic people that pop up and really, really lead and say, you know, we need to put some teeth in these agreements. We need to make sure a war like World War I never happens again. It's probably safe to say, me talking to you, the old guard, that not only if we were back in time, we'd know it would fail. Somehow we know that the dark part of reality knows it will fail. It wasn't taking a risk bringing people together. They actually may put agreements in to avoid war. And it's so fascinating to think, how does this happen? You know, well, Matt, it was, you know, the first grade truther would step forth and say, well, it was overseen by five to 10 really powerful insiders. And they chose the delegates themselves carefully. And they knew these delegates wouldn't get along. That, that's impossible. If, if these people actually started to get along and work through agreements that had real teeth that would not allow, I'll show you what Italy, what Italy did to Ethiopia. I mean, League of Nations forms, no more war. One year later, whenever it is, two years later, Italy just invades Ethiopia and starts slaughtering them all. League of Nations sits back and talks in their smoking rooms. The re it's fascinating. I, let's just continue. The reality itself knew, knew there's no harm in bringing these, these people together because it knew nothing would be accomplished. When in fact... Matt, it would be, it, there is no situation where anything could be accomplished, where war could be avoided. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. You put the right leaders in place with the right teeth in the agreements, where if somebody, if e Italy invades Ethiopia, there isn't just sanctions. All the nations come together to wage war on the one that broke the agreement. And don't say that that would never happen. The world was really terrified of real people in the world would have done heroic measures to avoid the horror of what they just saw with World War I. I don't know where this is going. Before moving to the next segment, let me just uh, talk about what you're looking at here. A segment of the movie um, talks about the finances, the, the money issue, or the cost of this thing comes up from time to time. The Supervisory Commission does meticulously work and oversees the finances of the League. Blah, 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 blah. But see, here's, here's what's so funny about how reality does business. You know, you know, okay, if anybody's screaming at me, Matt, if you're going to indict these people and you don't know these people, I hear you. And, but overall, it's pretty safe to say, wouldn't we agree, that these are the five guys that oversee the finances. Is there any doubt in your mind that these five are probably the most corrupt, <laughs> most on-the-take, corrupt, <laughs> um, wasting individuals? One's probably, one's like Wharton Norton from Shawshank. I apologize to these five. They're all dead. And if they're rolling in their graves, I don't know you, I apologize to you. But how reality generally works, the five people in charge of the finances, or, you know, whoever put them in position, would be the most corrupt people since Wharton Norton at Shawshank. More delegates arriving. Now, here we are inside the hall. At the end sits the president in his high chair. And immediately below him stands the speaker. On the floor of the hall sit the delegates. At the last meeting of the assembly, 26 ministers for foreign affairs, 28 cabinet ministers, 11 ambassadors, and 91 ministers plenipotentiary attended. Okay, here's somebody yelling at me, and they're right. Matt, you hear voices? Sometimes. Um, somebody would say to me that 
Matt, it's not some all-encompassing dark part of reality screen. Um, you know, they, they, they're, this is middle-level creep stuff, middle-level minion stuff. Or the people that have always had the money of this world, or the Windsors, or whatever, is the pu same puppet master pulling string, people pulling strings for the past thousand years. They, Matt, it's not that complicated. When you bring this many people together, what do you think they're going to be able to accomplish? Absolutely nothing. It's no different then let's get a representative and their secretary and their advisor from every single country of which at the time there were just over 100 countries in the world at this time. Now there are roughly 190 countries in the world. Let's get a representative, their secretary and advisor from 100 countries, 300 people, put them in a room and have them make soup. Would that work? No. So it may be, it may be is that simple. They present to the world, oh, we're going to try this thing, the League of Nations. They, they just, they know where they carry forth an understanding of how, quote, primitive mankind works, these, the, and at, even at the, the minion level, not just the dark screen, and, you know, maybe just a middle-level manager, minion-level conversation is more appropriate here. Whoever the bloodline is of the, the, the Rockefellers, or the J.P. Morgans, or the Vanderbilts, or the Harrimans, or the Rothschilds, or those that, you know, or the Windsors, those that have money and always have had money, or always have had had been pulling the strings for a long time. The same, what do you think happened to all the family lines and bloodlines that were related to these people called the Knights Templar? They don't exist, it just all went away. I mean, no, it, it still exists. That's why the Forbes and Fortune most richest people in the world list is a joke. The Forbes and Fortune list are paupers. It's new money. It's an absolute joke compared to the old money. And maybe they just know that, you know, look, They'll, everybody will go from countries with a good intention, and they just know how um, the non-evolved man and woman works. They will not be able to accomplish anything. If, if people, I think, pure, spiritually progressed people that are starting to have a certain understanding about themselves, people like us, were to be in that room, they would have sent people like us. I think it would have been different. I really do. Um, you can even say... You know, they're gonna, these people are there just going to go along with whatever the Nancy Pelosi of the era says to do. The Permanent Court of International Justice is an autonomous international organization composed of independent judges chosen to represent the main forms of civilization. The Permanent Court of International Justice is a Tartarian building with impossible architecture, and instead of debating the affairs of the world, the delegates end up debating who built the structure, when, how, and where. Guys, I want to stay on point and not turn this into a completely separate video. You know I don't really buy the Tartarian narrative at all. I think it was handed to the truth community as a big yellow distraction, as is a mud flood handed to the truth community. But I am a believer in those that advocate the impossible architecture, meaning there's too many of these buildings all over the world. They're not just cathedrals. They're not just the Great Pyramid. Um, there is no way that has been adequately explained to us through history how they could have been built. I am a believer in that, if that makes sense. Um, they weren't all built with pulleys, ropes, jackasses, donkeys, burrows, how many different names is there for a jackass or a donkey? And uh, Matt, you don't understand. There are YouTube channels that show how uh, these buildings can be made in with leverage, and you don't understand. Okay. It's a matter of just survival. You know what people were interested in in 1300, 1400, 1500, 1600, 1700, 1800? They were interested in survival. When my electricity goes out, you would think, oh, Matt, you just sit around and read a book. There's nothing to do. I'm 10 times busier when my electricity goes out. Just cleaning cat plates takes forever. It, no, there wouldn't have been the extra, um, you know, like S Star Trek presents a world where everything's been solved. They have free energy. They, all they, have t they have plenty of time to better themselves, to enrich themselves. There would be no time for all these buildings in 1400, 1500, 1600, 1700. The whole society is about survival. One crop goes down. I don't, I'm sorry I'm doing another video. This was wrong. But um, if there were three or four buildings, sure. But there's, there are now a thousand of these. Doesn't add up. We'll talk about some other time.
relations between Italy and Ethiopia had long been strained, and the matter came to a head on November the 26th, 1934, when an incident subsequently repeated on December the 4th occurred at Walwal, a village situated in the south of Ethiopia, in a region where the frontier has never been demarcated. Though this, these particular incidents were settled by arbitration, yet despite all the efforts of the League, the dispute between Italy and Ethiopia degenerated into war. Yet despite all the efforts of the League, <laughs> the dispute degenerated into war. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, guys. The Italy sent real troops in there. They killed real Ethiopians. I'm sorry, but just look the way he presented that. I mean, I, what are we so different from everyone else in this world? I mean, when we always say these other people are not like us, what what does he mean dispute? Guys, let's just start with the absolute basics. You know, you kind of know where Italy is. If even people that are not haven't spent t uh, hours and hours on their geography, you kind of know where Italy is. Now, it's not like Spain to Morocco. You can just take a little ferry. They're all right there. Ethiopia is kind of down, a ways down. A th it could be a thousand miles from Italy, at least 700, 800 miles. It's not just right there on Africa below Italy. You have to go all the way down. It's landlocked. You have to go through, what is it, Somalia or Djibouti? Or It's landlocked. Well, what do you mean a dispute? How could there possibly be a dispute? The Ethiopians would be like, what are you even doing here? What do you mean a dispute? You have no claim. You look. You have white skin. You you have no ancestral claim here. Get the fuck. Get the f out. What do you mean dispute? If Italians set one foot on Ethiopian soil and there's a dispute, the Ethiopians are like, well, you don't even belong here. We don't have forty five thousand Ethiopians up uh, flopping around Rome. What's the? What does he mean dispute? It makes no sense. It's like if, if I just break into your kitchen and start rummaging through the the the, ki the uh, refrigerator and you know buttering bread, and, but and there's a dispute between me and you. What am I? I shouldn't even be in your kitchen. What? So can anybody guess what happens? They start talking. The league starts talking about it and giving speeches. And here's the Italian representative to the League. And then the French delegate speaks. And then the Ethiopian delegate speaks. And even what the Ethiopian delegate says doesn't make any sense. Just as all this roundabout, flowery speech, the Ethiopian delegate should just stand up there and say, by the way, I looked into this, there was another Ethiopian-Italian war in the late 1800s. Again, the Ethiopians aren't, rummaging through the streets of Rome trying to sell surfboards. The Italians came down to Ethiopia. See, that kind of, to me, maybe it's just me, that puts one side to blame and the, uh, it leaves the Ethiopians off the hook. But maybe that's just me. I don't know. Maybe if somebody just came, came rummaging through my house, there could be a situation where I would be wrong. I, I don't know. But the Ethiopian delegate, I'll, 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 I'll play some of it for you. He should just stand up there and say, what are we even doing talking about this? The Italians shouldn't be in our freaking country. <laughs> what? Okay, I don't care what... I, Matt, did you really research it? No, I didn't research it. What, what possible research could I find that would allow the Italians to be in Ethiopia and to make their grounds just? I, am I missing something? Anyway, I'll show you. It makes the Ethiopian guy should be like, uh, they shouldn't be here, and obviously we're going to fight them as long as they're there. And this body, this government, international body should have teeth and threaten the Italians, not just with sanctions. That's what they, they, they put sanctions on them. Anything, any toothless body like this, I was doomed to fail. But see, if the world were real, if the world were real and you had, you know, real people in certain positions after World War I, you would have certain leaders that took over and, and even people involved in this in this council or this um, League of Nations saying there's no teeth here. We need to come together and say if there's an aggressor in the world, again, that every other nation that camps onto this or buys into this treaty, every other nation will go to war with that country if there's an aggressor from now on. So 
60, if, if Germany becomes an aggressor, what the League of Nations should have done if Germany becomes an aggressor under Hitler, if anything were real, this would have been put in place. I understand the world is not real. It's not as it's presented to us. But if it was real human beings, real spiritual beings, they would have said, look, we have an agreement where if there's another aggressor, we're not going to go through this again, this World War I. 60 countries will go against the aggressor. We will find the leader and hang them. It's that simple. Le gouvernement éthiopien est engagé à fond dans des opérations de légitime défense. Il tient pourtant à renouveler la déclaration qu'il a déjà faite. Il est à la disposition de tout organe qui pourrait être constitué par le Conseil ou par l'Assemblée en vue d'interrompre immédiatement les hostilités. Il est prêt à conclure une paix honorable, mais qu'on n'interprète pas mal les paroles et qu'on ne leur donne pas un, un sens qu'ils n'ont pas. Le gouvernement éthiopien a le devoir de proclamer en toute loyauté que, subissant une guerre injuste, décidé à défendre jusqu'à la mort son indépendance et son intégrité, quelque longue que doit être cette guerre, il ne cédera pas la force. Il n'acceptera aucune condition accordant une prime à son agresseur. Ce serait là un défi à la morale internationale. All right, the Ethiopian delegate to the Justice League here is, I believe he's speaking French. But remember, this is the first League of Nations. It's not the UN in New York City. It's Geneva. He's going to speak an international language of the region. Um, you, you know, mostly English and French are spoken at the League. I, I looked into it briefly. Ethiopia does not speak French. Although I did expect that France at one point as a... Um, intruding colonial power would have probably had their, their sticky fingers in there, or the Dutch or the Portuguese or the English or the Germans or whatever. But actually, Germans don't have the same reputation as the others because I guess there's their landlocked. They didn't have the fleet of ships, so they couldn't impose their sticky fingers all over the rest of the world like all the other colonial powers. So anyway, he's speaking French. And I understand, too, I want him to be more forceful. But look, you know, somebody might say to me, rising up, like, look, this is little Ethiopia, Matt. As far as he's concerned, all these... Other big Western powers are all in cahoots with each other, and he has to be somewhat respectful and okay, but he could be a little stronger. I mean, it's just strange. It's a little bizarre, his presentation. Here it says, having been made subject to an unjust war. And then he said something like earlier, we will uh, agree to an honorable peace, something like that, or a justified or honorable peace. But then he says basically, like, don't mix my words he says in a too nice of a way, you know, if the Italian army is in my country, we're going to fight to the death. Then why not just say that? I, I don't know why he's so, he's being so nice here. Okay, what is it, 1937? You know, if he just gets up there and says, look, does, can anybody in this body come to this microphone right now, any of you representatives, and say why, why give me good reason why the Italians are in my country? What if the Italians just marched into your country? I don't, he, okay, Matt, it maybe would be a little bit of a problem for him to be, to give the condescending speech that I would like to give, but it's a little too soft. I mean, again, what are the, I'm, I'm no uh, history major, but what, the, I would bet if I looked into it, the Italians probably don't have a good reason to have armies a thousand miles away from their shores in a foreign country. You know, this guy kind of has a point. So, you know, look, <laughs> And then it goes on, like I, like I, I guess I, I already showed in this video, that they, the, the, the League found, the Justice League found in favor of Ethiopia and then delivered sanctions. Oh, no. Sanctions. For proponents of the concept of the NPC, or there being a whole class of individuals here that are not spiritually the same as you and me and different types of people. This is about the best evidence you possibly could get for the NPC. And it's more about the repeating themes and repeating scripts. But before, I guess, well, it depends the order in which it was presented, but the French ambassador or the French uh, delegation to the Justice League, of course, he gets up there. What do you think he says? Nothing. Just says nothing. You know, the French government will devote itself passionately to this work of peace. Just flower this, flower that, just nothing. I mean, the British 
uh, ambassador, I don't know what you call the delegates, gets up there, basically says nothing. Uh, the British people believe in peace. Uh, war is reprehensible. We've always believed in peace. But what did you do through the East India Company the last three or 400 years? Okay, we'll just, we'll just forget about that. Um, I'll show you that if I can. He says nothing. The Italian, the, 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 the guy whose country is, whose armies are in Ethiopia, they don't show his whole speech. He says nothing. Nothing. And let me clarify, I mean, when I say they're saying nothing, I don't mean he's going up saying a few sentences and sitting down. These big, long, flowery speeches, I mean, they don't show the whole speech, but of course, 5, 10, 15 minutes of nothing. He's not saying anything. They're all giving these big, long, flowery speeches. They have a whole army of um, stenographers, I guess they're called, like a court reporter, and they have that's part of this presentation. Like, oh, they record all the speeches and document all the speeches. The person doing the court reporting the stenography would be like, hey, Betty, do you see a repeating theme here? He said the same damn thing last month. Hey, is he repeating? It? No, it's a new speech. It is? Look at all the same elements. I think he's just saying the same goddamn thing. He might, he, he probably, his Speech writers worked on it all night to avoid, try to avoid war <laughs> between Italy and Ethiopia. But he's just, he's saying nothing. Again, I don't, if anything were real, if, okay, Matt, what would you say? Well, I guess, what would I say? Okay, I'm fine. I'm the French representative then. This French representative, with real history, he went and read a big flowery speech that said absolutely nothing. I'd approach the podium, if it was me, I'd approach the podium, lean into the microphone, or pick up my bullhorn, or whatever they had, and I'd pick up my prepared speech, a bunch of papers, I'd say, see this speech? My speech writers were up all night preparing this for me. They just sipped cognac and ordered room service and smoked cigarettes and filled their bellies with baguettes all night to prepare this absolute turd of a speech. You know what? It's useless, and I'm throwing it out. I'd throw all the papers up into the air, and I'd say... My presentation is very simple. It doesn't need a flowery speech. Um, is the Italian delegation here, the, uh, the representative we heard from from Italy? Uh, is he, he, he's probably here somewhere, right? Uh, yeah, get it, stand him up. Stand him. There he is. Yeah, yes, sir. Stand up and be recognized. Stand up. Yes. Stand up and be recognized. Give him a round of applause. Um, sir, he, he, it's, it's very simple. You have an army in that man's country, and I'd be pointing uh, to the little Ethiopian guy. I, you have an army in that man's country. See, we came together as a body here in the League of Nations after World War I because we're not going to do this again. Homie, don't play that. I would say this. Homie, don't play this anymore. Okay? You have an army in that man's country. You need. To, there's no possible rationalization in the world for having an army in that man's country. You need to remove it immediately. Or, no, there won't just be sanctions. This body, we will move to invade your country. <laughs> there needs to be teeth behind bodies like the League of Nations. And the little, uh, the, this, at this point, Mussolini was an unknown at this point, basically. Nobody knew of Mussolini and all the dastardly deeds and everything. Be like, well, we're going to invade your country if you don't leave Ethiopia in 30 days. We will find your leader who will be, soon become infamous, Mussolini, and just like the agent of the court in Django Unchained, we will hang him by the neck. And for inter I remind you, sir, that interfering with a representative of the court, you will be hanged by your neck until you're dead. That's, there has to be teeth behind when, it, when a body like the Justice League comes together. So, you t see, there was no teeth to it. The Italians knew it. And I said, screw it. Let's just go down and invade Ethiopia. Now, look, anybody screaming at me from the bubbles, Matt, World War II was coming, or the pieces and the chess pieces and the pawns were being positioned by the slimy puppet masters to create the scenario for World War II. I hear you. It's ain't my first rodeo. I, I got you. Of course. Italy evading Ethiopia, probably part of that whole script planned out a long time ago. Of course, the pieces have to be put in place by their slimy, greasy fingers decades before anything happened. I got you. Ain't my first ro rodeo, but this is not what we're talking about here. I'm just saying, you know, what would happen if real people like you and me were the delegates at the League of Nations? You know, what, what, and it would, of course, it would never happen. The dark side of reality itself would send its NPCs or would send people there that just how somehow it would know that they would not be able to accomplish 
uh, anything. And maybe it's a simple fact of when you put that many cooks, when you put 400 cooks in a room to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, when it is that simple, you know, 400 cooks will screw up the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But what's most fascinating to me, um, guys, I, you know, I hear you. This is, this is all building up to World War II. That's another, another video for another time. But what's fascinating to me is this French guy you see here, or the uh, Italian delegation, or the del you know all the ones that gave the speeches? They're not in on it. They're not in on it. No. Somehow this reality gets what it wants without people, without 98 percent or more, 99.5 being in on it. Every delegation's there thinking they're doing the right thing. Where it's almost like whatever you represents reality in the behind the curtain is laughing at everybody, knowing they won't be able to get anything done. They're not in on it. They're all there. If they put them on a lie detector test, if a lie detector test existed at the time, they would pass, saying, we're here to really try to help. But we know, and we would know it if we were in that room, knowing what we know now, and we let's say we don't know the history that's coming or the history that's already failed, we would know um, per the way this reality runs its cycles and the repeating scripts and themes that they would never be able to accomplish anything. So then you get into, well, these people just NPCs going through the motions, just just not have you know just basically like reading from a script where they themselves are not even aware that they're reading from a script like all the people in the room there that are 10 times more educated than I am they would have no ability to know the history of when you put a bunch of men in a room to talk and negotiate these sorts of things nothing ever happens the I mean, you could say, can anybody here raise their hand and tell me one success of putting men together to talk through disputes, going back, say, to the time, even through past the time of the Trojan War? Is it, has it ever helped? Has it ever accomplished anything? No. So th those men have no ability to know the history on this. Like they would know ten times more about it than I would, for example. So the only the what see where this is going. That they would, somebody would have reason if these are not NPCs and say, this will fail unless there is teeth, unless every country here agrees that if there is another aggressor for the history through all through time, if there is one more aggressive country, everybody here has to go to war against that country. So if Italy is going to stay in Ethiopia, 80 countries have to go to war against Italy. That's the only way this works. But I'm the only one, Matt is the only one that can realize this. Of course, you get into the fact that these, who knows if they're just these people, these delegates were the same as you and me. Then what happened? <laughs> World War II came. They did it all over again. <laughs> they put, oh my gosh. They put an international body in New York, the United Nations. Well, the League of Justice failed to prevent another world war and failed to present, prevent conflict after World War I. What are we going to do? Um, I have an idea, the exact same thing, but well then it's the but we'll rename it. It's not called the League of Nations anymore. We'll call it the United Nations. But it it's the exact same thing. What makes you think this one's going to work? Ugh, guys, I, and then people screaming at me uh, rising up. I can I hear you say Matt because of the rock it's Rockefeller's land and their the influence of this one was meant to fail as well meaning they all were meant to fail and it's not some dark element uh, standing behind the screen it's just the minions like Rockefeller okay you can believe what you believe in the end of the day we basically view the dark element the same way yes of course it was doomed to fail it's just fascinating to discuss how that comes about and if you found yourself again as a delegate in the League of Nations you couldn't, even though you might not be aware the whole thing is doomed to fail as a real spiritual person, you couldn't, you couldn't give a certain, a different, you couldn't go against the grain, you couldn't get people thinking a little bit differently, you couldn't give a different kind of a speech regarding that Italian Ethiopia situation. We don't find one example of anybody doing anything a little different. Everybody reads from their cue cards. It's like, it, it is great proof that these people are either on the download, on the frequency, or NPCs, or if there's any difference. Uh, among the three. So they did the whole thing all over again with the United Nations. If anything were real, the first speech given by whatever country, if any, if these people were real people the way we are, the first speech would have been, you know what, I'm happy to be here, but you see, 
guys, why what why do we would we think this will work when the League of Nations didn't and every other group of men meeting and women meeting together and then imposing sanctions and see, guys, if we're about to do this all over again in this beautiful Rockefeller sponsored United Nations building, the first person giving the first speech should say, We have to have teeth behind it or every one of us should walk out. And again, it's there these people are generally not real people like you and I. They probably deep down don't give a crap about avoiding conflict. Matt, you're imposing your standards of morality and conscience, conscience on these people. They're they're psychopaths. They're or they're vessels, they're empty vessels. They don't have the, I understand that's one of the major points of my presentation. They're not the same as you and me. I'm only saying this is just reality gives itself away. The first speech would have been like, we can't just do this all over again. We have to have real teeth or we all should walk out. I mean, all they don't care about avoiding conflict. In fact, it's just the opposite. I would say the United Nations has caused conflict more than it's avoided conflict. For the most part, the, the useless delegates that have gone in and out of this building for the past 40 years don't give a crap about they have an American Express black card. They never see the bill. These, this is what keeps the $4,000 a plate probably in some New York City restaurants, op- opening $1,000 bottles of uh, Baron de Rothschild wine and the whole wineries associated with the Rothschilds. They never see the bill. It just goes in the American Express black card. Then let's go to the opera. Let's go to the shows. Let's get some girls. They don't give a crap. These uh, delegates from various countries, these international bodies, has any of them ever walked away from it? Just said this is useless. This is They just walked out. I mean, I, hopefully a few have. It's probably extremely rare. How, what what accomplishments? What are the accomplishments of this body? Um, we'll talk about certain treaties, or but what are what are the real accomplishments that anybody could point to on the ground, making the, the quote life of the human being better? If, as far as I would think, there would be no no accomplishments, and uh, I don't think the people that are attending these meetings and going to these five thousand dollar dinners are the same as you and me, spiritually.